All right. So, <clears throat> hey, Anthony, can you hit that timer for me, bro? I appreciate you. All right, cool. So it's it's been a while since I've uh, done one of these. You know, I kind of um, merged the breakfast of champions, quote unquote, to a what's up, guys? To a, um, to kind of like a vlog series that is located on a channel on social media. And if you, if you guys are interested in, in viewing that, feel free to hit me up. I know a lot, a few of you already do. And the information I'm going to share with you is a little bit different today because it's going to apply to newer agents. I got some senior CSRs just about to get into the game. And then I have seasoned veterans who've been doing refinance like me for, for a minute now, as well as uh, even some reverse agents, right? And so you got a kind of a different um, landscape, whereas commonly, usually it was, it was primarily for refinance agents and one particular product. So we're not going to talk about purchase. <laughs> in this meeting. Just want to give you a quick... <laughs> yeah. Can we uh, talk now? You're not going to hear the word pal from my mouth um, throughout this meeting, but what I do want to um, share with you are some common nuances that I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to study because, you know, first off, if you're like me, I didn't want to do the extra work to get the same results as someone doing all the extra work. And so I didn't... I didn't you know, I, it, for me, it was not valuable to chase a prospect. And so from a, kind of from a lazy perspective, I wanted to minimize that. More importantly, I really liked the ability to leave when I wanted to and not have to, you know, kind of give up my weekends if I didn't need to. I prefer to look at the weekends more of kind of like a, um, kind of a, a buffer. Like if I wanted to get, increase my income, if I wanted to get anything, I would use the weekend to add on top of the week. Whereas we're in a different kind of, of, of market where now we need to, we need the weekend just to kind of breathe, <laughs> right? Just, just kind of put, put rhyme and reason to the last two weeks that we put in. And so the information I'm going to share with you is in all reality is just strictly on sales. But there's going to be some information here that, that is being used and practiced by corporations, businesses. And this is where the science of it comes into play, where you're able to track your own activity. And why it's important to track your own activity is because if you don't know where you're going, you don't know what path you're on. Does that make sense? So in other words, let me, let me give you an example. If currently right now you're making a lot of actions, you're doing a lot of calls, you're doing a lot of emails, you're doing all this stuff but no results that you, you want are coming back, it means you don't necessarily, kinda, you know, you don't necessarily have a, a, a path. There's no real science to it. And so I noticed that from efficient closers and natural closers. Natural closers are people that could do 18 hours a day. Natural closers are those that just don't, you know what I mean? They just, all they do is work. And I respect that because they live that lifestyle. Whereas also on the other side of the spectrum, there were efficient closers. Efficient closers really caught my eye because when I got into this industry, I already had a family. I had a, I had a little baby girl, and you know, I, liked, I liked being outside and doing what I do. And so I studied that side of the table because I noticed that they can put in eight hours a day and still get the same results. Stounded me. You know? I was like, okay, cool. How do, how do I do that? And so I'm going to share with you a few things that they've taught me along the way because I had a choice. I had a choice to, and this is really how I should open up this meeting. You're going to notice that even though this was voluntary, and I am fortunate enough to have about four branches across the country also logged in on WebEx, I want you to look around and realize how many people did not take the opportunity that you guys are taking right now. And I want to give you credit because you're making moves, and that's the mindset you need going into this market. Because if someone said, hey, I have an answer to help improve or increase your income, I have an answer to help shed away those sleepless nights, that anxiety, that frustration that you go through. All you have to do is make it in at 8 a.m. And you'll see that sometimes we just don't make the move. Some of us don't make the move, some of us do. You guys have, and so I appreciate you for that and I don't want you to think that you're not getting credit for being here right now. But the investment of your time that I'm gonna give back to you are certain things that businesses, like I said, use on a, on a mag, on a mag, uh, mag, I'm looking for a word. <laughs> <laughs> on a major scale, right? And ultimately what it comes down to is not necessarily a seat. And so I want to give you that perspective from a business standpoint because a business operates through revenue and they have to be efficient. And so when, when you see like these charts or these, uh, these progress reports, what they're known as are KPIs. You guys have heard of KPIs before? 
If you have not, it's very important to understand what a KPI is because it's actually how you are ruled <laughs> from behind the curtain. Does that make sense? So KPI stands for Key Performance Indicators. And being in management for as long as I have and being in sales for as long as I have, this I have found to be a true unlock to being an efficient closer. Because KPI is ultimately a kind of like a milestone, kind of like how our loans go from started to qual to processing to submission. Does that make sense? It moves along this line. Um, ultimately, KPI also moves along a line towards funding. And so let me give you an example of what KPI is. So first KPI could be lead to credit pool. Next KPI could be credit pool to lock. Next would be lock to, what is it, submission. And then next is submission to fund. Does that make sense? And so each one is this milestone that we, we kind of put on, on, on a repeat every single day with every single contact, every single person that we engage with, we want to put them through this cycle. This is what I'm talking about when I say like, like, hey, figure out your sales cycle. Your sales cycle is your process. Everyone has a different process. Like there are agents on the floor right now that sell in a completely different way. Hey, do you mind um, turning the AC down on that cue? It's getting like a sauna up on her. And so where, where I'm getting at is that, you know, depending on your style, and so I'm going to show you kind of the science and the structure of it, and you adjust it per your style. Because some people are not aggressive closers, some people are not introverted or passive closer. I'm more of a passive closer, because I've understood that passive does not invite the friction into the engagement. And the second you invite friction into the engagement, you lost. And so it's important to understand these certain milestones because you may have a problem with taking it from credit pool to lock, but you don't have a problem with getting lead to credit pool. So you're very efficient at getting the social security number, you're very efficient at getting the credit pool, but for whatever reason, you can't lock them. And so if that's your problem, then you don't need to necessarily worry about lock the suckers. Boo boo, you're not even getting there. Does that make sense? You're far from. And so what if you were taking all these leads and making to credit pool? So you'll know you're doing this because your credit pool ratio is very high. So out of 10 people, you're, you're easily pulling credit at eight people. And that in itself is a talent. So take that as an award because there are a lot of agents that simply can't. They're turning at maybe 15% or 20%. And so I show you these milestones because in some area you're having an issue right now and only in that area you're having an issue right now. Does that make sense? where if we feel like we're having an issue with sub to fund, we'll, 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 we'll make as if the entire process don't work, where you don't need to fix this part. All you need to do is make some minor tweaks, let's say in this KPI, and everything else will flow congruently. Everything will flow more smoothly. And so, you know, I had this, uh, this checklist of, of things that I'm gonna cover in this meeting, and I'm still gonna cover it, but I need you to understand kind of the, the basis of, of the meeting. And it's a, really about showing you how to be efficient with your time, but also position you properly to where you are more likely to earn that sale in this market. And so one of the bullet points, if you guys haven't read, um, was like selling rate and fees, right? Or um, unable to complete the application. And if you look at your KPI, which your KPI should rule you, you should understand your KPIs. Because if, you're, if, you're, if you only need a, an adjustment, you'll notice that there's just one minor tweak that you could take that will ripple through the rest of your cycle, your process. And so, you know, selling rate and fees typically happens usually in its assign through credit pool and lock or lead to credit pool, right? So if you're having an issue with getting over that objection, we in management can clearly see where it's happening. But then it becomes up to your manager on how they communicate that to you, right? And I'm not saying you know, anyone's doing anything wrong, but it's just all of how you understand this. And so I hope to help you understand this because it will kind of open your eyes to, to a little bit more efficiency that you could use today. So that way you're not pulling you know, 12, 14 hour days. I hope you don't have to go through that. But usually when we have a problem with getting a lead to a credit pool, it's because of the way we're intaking the lead. And so um, you know, Cass, how many of us right now are just strictly taking dialer leads? Okay, yeah, so, 
So that's what I mean. So there's a difference here of, of the audience, but it's okay. I'm, I'll adapt it because you're, it's overall just the mindset and the psychology of it all, okay? Um, whereas my team, for example, we're, we live in the shark tank, <laughs> right? We, we um, you know, the retention team, you know, I, I kind of got a mixture of team, right? Like, so not all my team does strictly re retention, but we, we, find, um, we find value in what others ultimately miss and let slip. That makes sense? We're your reminder. Like, you don't want it to get to my team. <laughs> because if it got to my team, then guess, who, guess who's taking it over? And what I've noticed is that it's just simple things that we've done to help manage to bring this person back. And that in itself is a challenge because that person already told themselves, no, I'm not going with this company, right? So technically, that is a harder sale to take someone who's already in process, almost about to close, or already gone through 75% of the process and bring them back home. Right? That's very hard. And my agents do it all the time. These are people that already invested six, sometimes two months of their lives, gone through nightmares with other companies, and we come in and we say, hey, let's start the process all over again. And so you got to be really efficient with that, but ultimately what it is, and, and, and you're going you're gonna to hear more about this in tomorrow's training, of like an effective voicemail. In, in all reality, what we want as salesmen is simply the attention. Right, and so we just want a connection. And so if right now you're looking at these connections through dialers or you're looking at these connections through follow-ups and you're like, damn, no one, ever wants to, no one ever wants to talk to me. No one ever qualifies. And we choose to, to go in with that kind of perception, it's going to affect the rest of us, of, of our cycle. Does that make sense? So it's gonna actually linger on to the files that you got locked and you're trying to get documents back because the frustration you have in trying to understand these leads. And so it's important to properly manage kind of these emotions because this is just something that we go through, right? So you'll find yourself there at times where you're just like, fuck, and then two minutes later, you're like, yeah, <laughs> right? Like, that's some schizo shit, like, if you ask me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy, right? We just go up and down, up and down, and this is why it's not necessarily meant for everyone. However, if we understood the science and then you took bits and pieces of the wordplay, you can create an engine that operates on its own. And so if I were having issues, and I'll help you guys out, if a lot of you guys are taking leads from a dialer, I've, I've been in this game for 20 years. I started as a telemarketer. Um, I, I was known for my outbound skills, my, my telephone uh, wordplay. And, and some people will look at it and say, oh, D, man, you got that psychology stuff, man. I don't, I don't know the psychology stuff. And however you react to certain things, you react to everything that way. And so, in other words, if some of us, like, who didn't come to this meeting would look at it and be like, oh, here goes D again with that Breakfast of Champions stuff, sales remastered, remaster this, makes sense? People will react, and it's okay. But how you react to one thing is how you react to everything, and this is where the mindset comes into play. So understanding, understanding that same philosophy to our leads, our leads, I think it's fair to say, none of them want to talk to us. <laughs> Let's go and accept that, right? But what they do want, right, there is this, uh, uh, I, had, I had a few mentors coming up, and uh, one mentor who taught me how to be efficient said this one statement that it took me a, a long time to really understand. And the, uh, the statement was, people don't know what they like. They like what they know. Get it? So in other words, consumers, they don't know what they want. So they'll ask in the only way that m protects them, because it is human nature for us to protect ourselves, get it? And so we don't want to look stupid. We do it all the time on the phone. We don't want to look stupid, so we just give out answers, right? Because we believe as a, as a kind of a customer service position, as a loan consultant, it is our job to serve. And so these prospects come in with this mindset of, I don't want to talk to a salesman. I don't want to get sold, right? I don't want to be harassed. I don't want to be pressured. And we go into that engagement sounding like a salesman, unknowingly. And so I invite you, I invite you to open your eyes to a different way to, to control momentum. When you think of momentum like when you are thirsty, right, and you're going towards your kitchen, imagine yourself. Like you're going to yourself to the kitchen because you're really thirsty. There's a momentum about you. You have something in your mind you need to complete. You need to get done. Get it? And so these prospects have the same thing, but we'll sometimes judge them because of their tonality, because it sounds like they don't want to talk to us, and we 
take it personal. This person doesn't know you, <laughs> right? They don't know you and their aggression is not about you. But if you, if, what if I told you there was a way to take that aggression and transfer it to interest, transfer it to curiosity so that they follow you and they do what you say. And, and that's where the statement comes in. People don't know what they like, they like what they know. And if you, if for example, if on the phone right now, you're offering products, like you're throwing it out, there's a tonality of offering, right? Like, hey, Mr. Jones, I just want to see if you're interested to pull any cash out, maybe do some home improvements. That's a tonality of offering. Does that make sense? There's a completely different tone when you're driving. And you hear me say driving, like, well, D, what, what does that mean, bro? I'm driving. I'm talking about your vlogs. All you do is drive, bro. No. I'm not talking about that driving. I'm talking about driving the conversation as if there is momentum, like someone's heading towards the fridge to get a drink and you're just following the momentum. Does that make sense? You're going with them. And so where we face challenges that we're not driving, we are offering. And so what happens is we become kind of like, if you guys ever gone into like a Verizon store or like a store where the sales agent just kind of comes up and says, hi, can I help you with anything? And then what do you do? You say, no, I'm okay, right? And then what do they do? Okay, thanks. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, right? And then they wait. They're not driving you to the sale, whereas someone who is driving you to the sale would come up to you and say, hey, thanks for coming in. What kind of phone you got? iPhone? Oh, man, check out these new accessories. So the reason why you know, people with iPhones buy this is because they really enjoy blah, 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 blah. So if that's something that you're looking for, right, and you're just trying to extract information, because again, the key thing is just to get the attention. And we've got the attention if we got the connection. Regardless, you have their attention. It is up to you on how to continue grabbing that attention and, and bringing them your way. Make sense? So you might be like, well, D, how can I grab their attention if all they're worried about is the lower rate? Simple, understand that everyone is just, lowered about, is just worried about the lower rate. Understand that, like I said, people naturally want to protect themselves so they don't want to sound stupid. They say things that they really don't understand. <laughs> we do it all the time. Like, you know, I'll say things I, I honestly don't, you know, that's another thing. But where, where they come in and they don't understand, they feel the need to protect themselves, their statement sounds like this. I don't have time. That's how they protect themselves. Or what's your lowest rate? I don't want to pay fees. This is how they protect themselves. And what happens because we hear it as salesmen, we're service oriented, we feel that we need to respond. And what happens when we respond, we sometimes, we, we feed into the, the friction. And now it just becomes a debate when all reality, that person was thirsty. All we had to do was just find out what does he want to drink? Does that make sense? And so, and so, you know, I did this one episode that was, it, it, it explained spork. You know, I do freestyle sessions on, on, on the vlog. And, and this one thing I came up with was a spork. Do you guys remember what sporks are? Anyone remember? <laughs> right? It was the spoon with the fork. And so I use that as an analogy because let's say someone came in, they just needed a fork, right? Like, like hey, man, I'm just looking for the best fork you got, really cheap fork. And all you had was sporks. Some people are going to look at it and man, man, all I got is this sport, <laughs> right? But other people will look at it like, yeah, no worries, but what happens when you eat soup? Hey, check this out, I got you. Does that make sense? So you're, you're actually finding things that, that, that they will ultimately need because you're translating their message. And so more effectively, if I were taking leads from a dialer right now, I would understand that one, all of them are going to ask for a lower rate, but they only ask if you let them ask. And so if you haven't used my script yet, my script has nothing to do with rate. If anything, it, it, helps, it helps them understand that they're going to save time and they're going to stop in the conversation if I can't move any further. If anything, I'm going to point them in the right direction. Make sense? Whereas a lot of people who have issues with this KPI from lead to credit pool, their intro sounds like this. Hey, Jim, thanks for holding. This is Dan with New American Funding. How can I help you today? That's where they have issues. Why is because you've given them the opportunity to say, yeah, I'm just looking for your lowest rate. And then what happens unknowingly, our subconscious reacts because our memories are referencing the rate sheet. Our memories are referencing that good market of 3.25.
So then we'll ask the part, okay, well, what rate do you have? <laughs> Does that sound familiar? We respond, well, what rate do you have? I got 3.25, 30-year fixed. Oh, and then your mindset goes down even further. But if we take a step back and we look at it, right, like we watch children play. Like I, I got kids, so I get to watch them go through things and them experience things. I already know the result, right? So if you look at your cycle, kind of like a third party looking in, you'll notice that we forgot the fact that they just needed something. They, need, they were thirsty, basically. They needed savings. And so if we bring back the, the, the true purpose as to why they need the lower rate, we can actually continue to capture their attention. Because again, people like what they know. Get it? And so you might be like, well, Daniel, I, I, I don't get it, bro. <laughs> what are you talking about like what they know? Like what they know is to like, okay, well, if someone said, hey, D, what, you know, what's your lowest rate? If I allowed them to ask me that question. I, I underline that if I allowed them to answer that question. So in other words, you allow them to. You have a choice to put that in, pers in perspective, at least from the very first part. Because it's different if they ask you that question at the close. You kind of got that bond already. Does that make sense? But if you're having issues with selling rates and fees or points and you're having issues on getting the credit pool, it's because typically you're giving too much information. The same mentor gave me this advice that, again, it took me like three weeks. I was young. I was like 20 years old, so I didn't understand what it meant. There were no memes, all right? Instagram wasn't a thing, right? So, you know, when he said this thing, he, ha he, he was telling me this because he heard me on the phone. He sat right next to me, and when I first came into real estate, I came in as a telemarketer, and I just got promoted. I got promoted real quick. So it was very smooth on the phone, and, and I took a lot of leads. I did a lot of hours because what I wanted were what the other agents had. They had the nice car, they had the new phone, they had the nice suits, and I wanted that. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna figure this out, I'm gonna figure this out. And so what I was doing was I was, I was you know, doing what I thought was right. I was putting the extra hours, I was taking a ton of apps, ton of leads, and I could not sell because I came up with a subprime lender. And subprime lender, in case you guys don't know what that is, it's, a, it's like a below credit lender, <laughs> right? It just gives you, they basically have super high interest rates. And at the time, we were selling adjustable rate mortgages two years with three year prepay. So you're bound to get a prepayment penalty. You're okay with that, right? And prepayment penalties were six months of interest, crazy penalties. And I could not sell it. And so he reached out to me, you know, the young Daniel was like, hey bud, let me tell you something. And this is one of the one of the closers. This dude was uh, just a G, like an old school guy, right? Like kind of like Lazinski. Imagine Lazinski if he dressed like Kings of Comedy. Remember how Kings of Comedy dressed up with them? Like, did you just crease your jeans, bro? Like that? Like he he was like that. His name is Milton, and um, and and Milton was real cool. He's like, hey, young blood, you call me young blood. He's like, hey, young blood, you know, um, I hear you. You're doing all the right moves. You're taking all the right actions, but but you're, you're giving them too much information, right? They're, they're done with you. They're just using you. And I didn't get that. I didn't get that they were using me. And he told me, he's all, hey man, the sales, the sales cycle is a give, take, give, take relationship. If you find yourself giving, 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 and you're not taking anything, who's, what, are, what, are you, what are you, right? You are a directory. You are an information pamphlet. Once they get the information, they're done with you. And then he told me this, and again, this is where it took like damn near three months to understand what he meant. He said, less history, more mystery. I didn't understand what the hell he meant. So ultimately what, it, what, what I found it to be was that if I left curiosity, a little bit more mystery as to what will happen on the next step, the likelihood of them wanting me follow, follow me to the next step is very high. And this is in a market where we were selling seven and a half uh, adjustable rate mortgages with a three-year prepay and three points on the front. These were, this were massive loans. But why? Why would they do that, right? And so what I found out is that they didn't care about the interest rate. They didn't care about the pricing. What they cared about was the result that our service would give them. Does that make sense? And so we were trained because we got the same objections at the time, like, hey, Daniel, what's your lowest rate? And what am I going to do? Say, oh, 8% when the average lender was given six. We're two points above. So we were taught on how to divert that attention away and how to sell tax uh, uh, deferral, I'm sorry, tax relief, uh, payment deferral, and debt consolidation. But the key thing is of how they taught you how to sell it was that you didn't sell it until you needed to sell it. They taught me that marketing, selling, and closing are three different things. And it was interesting because I always kind of thought selling and closing were the same. Selling is actually our first conversation. 
Closing is done on the close call. Make sense? Where we kind of got it backwards. We believe marketing is our first call. And you know you believe marketing is your first call because you're like, oh yeah, we got the harp or we got the home ready program. Bro, you are a marketing ad, right? So their marketing is done. That's how you got, they got to you. Does that make sense? That's why we rely, this is how we get pumped full of leads is because NAF has this engine, this marketing engine that does very well. And so now that we have the attention, now it's a matter of, okay, well, well how do I sell this attention? And the only way to really sell somebody is through empathy. And there's this ratio, the same mentor taught me about like how, um, you know, you have two ears and one mouth because you're supposed to listen to, uh, two times more than you speak, right? Uh, there was like this, he told me that um, if you, though, the one who talks the most loses the sale. And again, I was like, man, what's, what's all this Confucius shit, bro? Just tell me what, what do I got to do? Like, I'm, I'm over here with Yoda. Like, I'm not trying to crack these riddles, bro. What do you mean? And so I found out what he meant. And what he meant was, um, you know, if you, if you give them too much information, they don't necessarily need you. But if you capture their attention in a way to make them want the result of your service, you can close them. And so the first call, he told me that it was selling. And so first call, selling is really all about listening. And this is where his statement of people like what they know is because if you listen to them, the reason why they need the lower rate is because they are maxed out on their credit card debt. The reason why they need the lower rate is because the wife lost her income or income's changed. Liabilities have increased. Their three-year-old is now six. Mom's back to work and now we got daycare expenses. Make sense? And when you listen, instead of trying to speak and sell and be like, oh, but wait, we got the home ready program. We got PIWs. The hell is a PIW, bro? I don't know what you want. You sound like a salesman. I don't want it. That makes sense. And so this is where, it, you know, it comes into play with like the lead uh, to credit pool. It's going to affect you in that way because of just one minor adjustment and it's just going about it on the intake call a little bit different and the rest will ripple through the process. It's, it's, it's crazy how accurate it is because it will, it will gauge who, whose call should be monitored, right? And so if we see someone taking a high amount of lead intake, but they're having issues with grading credit pools, then we'll, we'll, we know that it's up front it's because they're trying to close when it's, when it's only time to sell. Does that make sense? So they're closing too soon. These are typically the agents that, that will either defeat themselves because their mind is just focused on the rate or they'll, um, they'll simply give up because of like, oh, you got a great rate right now, <laughs> right? You, no, you shouldn't do anything. Who are we to justify that though, right? I, I've seen, I'm seeing it all the time where people are, are increasing their interest rate because they need X, Y, and Z, right? And, incre and increasing the interest rate is just kind of like, man, you got to get dressed to go to the gym. Like, yeah, it's a nuisance, but how else are you going to get the result, <laughs> right? It's like waking up early or whatever. And so, but the KPI is, is important because if you understand what your ratio is, and I invite you to meet with your manager and find out and say, you know, um, I'd like to look at my own KPI with you. And by him even hearing you say that, will just put his perspective on a whole new level. And more importantly, it's going to return the investment because you're going to learn exactly where you may need repair, right? So moving on to, like, uh, to credit pool, because I, I don't think we have an issue with pulling credit pool. Sometimes we may have an issue with, um, with getting the person to show up to the sales pitch, right? Sometimes they'll just go ghost and completely disappear on you. And so what I found is that it's typically the way we transition into the sales pitch, meaning that we, uh, um, some agents are different. Some agents will give a sneak preview of pricing before the pitch, right? Some agents don't even do a second call. Some agents go straight into the pitch. And it really depends on you know, your style and your method. There's some agents who've been here for a long time and their goal is to keep them on the phone for an hour before they pitch them because the idea is that you tire them out. I think that you just get someone real frustrated. <laughs> is this done, bruh? <laughs> right, like that's the, what I'm thinking about. Anyway, um, you know, so to each his own, but I would like to look at it through empathy and I believe that empathy is how you truly sell. Empathy is basically your, your, your listening to them personally, right? Like you're experiencing it through them. It's, it's kind of like sympathy. Um, but empathy is more or less understanding their tie to the result that they need. And so when, when I 
when I transitioned to second pitch or those that I've studied transition to second pitch, what I found the most effective way is that you don't give them too much information. In other words, if you're giving them a sneak peek of what you think you might get, don't. Instead, build up the transition where they, they don't believe that that pitch call is a pitch call, right? Like, you're, in other words, you're not, you're not telling them, hey, at five o'clock, I'm gonna give you a call with a couple options. Learn how to change your lexicon or learn how to change the word you use, right? And I catch myself sometimes saying it too, and I try to catch myself and try to replace that word. You might be like, well, D, why? Because if I say the word options, they're listening, right? And they're listening and they're trying to process what they understand because we say a lot of things that they don't understand. 30-year fix, 25-year term, your DTI, LTV, right? And so they'll pick up things that they hear and they'll process it real quick and say, ooh, I know what that means, <laughs> right? Um, and this is one of the main reasons why they turn you down if you outbound call them and say cash out, refinance, interested, right? They, they're triggered. It's kind of like when they hear, can I help you? They're triggered to view you as a salesman. Like, no, nah, I'm okay, I'm okay, right? So we have to pay attention to those, those certain things. Um, but where, where, we, where I found it be useful to create a transition was more or less like, hey, I have an idea. Before I go over it though or release it, I want to make sure what my, that my manager approves it. If he does, I'll, I'll, I'll confirm either way, if yes or no. And um, I do need your consent before I release the information. Now, before I set up the transition, I pay attention to two things, two primary things that I think you guys are really gonna take value from. If you do this today, the chances are that they'll answer the phone, but you'll sell them because you have their full attention. So there's two things that I pay attention to. Is there, number one is their, is their time zone and distance from work to home. I'm gonna be like, D, why? And I'll tell you why. Um, usually why is because, let's say if it's an East Coast person, and I did a quick Google map from their office to their house, and I found out that their commute was 28 minutes, then I know I have a 28 minute window to capture him while he's in commute, get it? More importantly, I know that, okay, this guy is an office manager and he's probably out at like five o'clock. So I'll find out through my conversation because I'm already planning for the pitch. Does that make sense? But sometimes we miss these little subtle clues that can actually help us close the pitch. And so one of the subtle clues, for example, would be like, you know, you're asking questions like, hey, how much do you send on credit card debt? And he's, and he's like, hey, I think we, or we send, that means there's another person involved. So you have to make room for that person. The last thing you want to do is pitch that person alone at a time where they're not giving you full focus and then they have to go reiterate it to their wife because they're not going to remember what you talked about. Make sense? All they're going to remember is the rate and the cost. They're not going to justify all the emotions that you captured with that person on the phone because he just simply does not know how to reiterate it to his spouse. And his spouse will become the main reason why they don't answer the phone when you try to call back with a follow-up. Right? Unless your wordplay on voice messages is very, is very good, in which we'll learn what that wordplay is tomorrow um, for the sales training. But you know, when, 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 when you look at the conversation as a whole, ultimately what you do is you find out the reason, their why, right? Like their, their perspective, how they view things, but we do it in different ways. And so the common agent would go through the 1003 in order. Right, like, uh, like how long have you lived here, got it, where do you work, what's the name of your employer? And what I've learned is that in a sales conversation, the way to not trigger them to believe that they're being sold is, that, is the difference. And I'm gonna give you an example. So there's a difference of saying, you know, uh, where do you work, what's, what's your title? The, right, so again, the question is, where do you work, what's your title, versus saying, hey, what do you do? <laughs> get it? One is an app, the other is an application, or the other is a conversation. And it's important to make your first engagement feel like a conversation. We've gone through the process enough times where we already kind of know the nuts and bolts that we need in order to make a loan, right? It's not the address of the employer. I got Google for that. Make sense? I don't need your work phone number on the first call. These people are, are being conditioned to believe that they're applying. And this is why they'll give you friction. Hey, hey, why does that matter? Just let me know what your lowest rate is. And then, damn, we get caught off, right? And so another thing is that when you take an inbound call and you're, you're, you know, the whole process in itself is that they're saying that they want something. And so if they say, hey, you know, uh, I need to know what your lowest rate is, always agree. Never ask them, hey, well, what's your rate right now? 
don't get into that game yet, yet, right? We'll get into that game, that part of the portion or that part of the conversation when the time is right. But in the very beginning, when you take that inbound call, everything is agreeing, right? Like, uh, hey, you know, Dan, I just want your lowest rate. Yeah, no worries, I got you. I'm actually gonna send it to your Yahoo account. You wanna look at their BV and see that they got a Yahoo, a Gmail, or, or, or whatever, right? And the reason for that is because they feel that they've succeeded already or they're gonna succeed with you. And this immediately ties them to you. Make sense? So if they called in and say, hey, Daniel, I want the 1.25 30-year fix with no fees and a 24-hour uh, turn time. Yeah, no worries. I'm actually going to get you the information and I'm going to send it out to your Yahoo account. This is for your property on Myford, right? Got it. Is this where you live? Perfect. If you, if, you know, when was the last time you looked at your credit score? Right? And uh, they, they might say, well, I looked at my credit score like a month ago through Karma. It was 758. Got it. Besides the mortgage, are there any other debts that you have, like installment loans or credit cards? Because the information that I'm going to send out to you is actually going to be pretty accurate. You see, I'm a direct servicer for the source. In other words, I'm not a bank, I'm not a broker, I don't sell your loan. We are only able to put in front of you what you actually qualify for. So fortunately, it's gonna save you a bunch of time, but here's the thing, I can only move forward if I can actually help you. If I can't, I'll at least point you in the right direction. So I'm gonna keep this super quick. <laughs> Get it? How do, you, how do you fight that? Shit, I wanna give myself my own social. <laughs> no, I'm just like, but, but do you get what I'm saying? So everything is in agreement. Everything is moving. Yeah. Sorry, what was that line you said? I'm a direct servicer and what? I'm a, dire I'm a direct servicer for the sources. And well, ultimately what that means is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, VA, FHA. I don't dive into that topic though. I just basically say I'm a direct conduit. I'm a direct servicer for the source. In other words, you're not, you're not paying Uber to get to me. You're already with me. Right? Like I'm not a middleman or a broker. So here's the, you know, and so here, that you bring up a good question because when we are coming in new, we sometimes feel like we need to tap dance. And I promise you, you don't need to tap dance yet, right? Like, because what I mean by tap dance is, uh, hey, this is Daniel with New American Funding. It's a great day today. And so we got this spectacular program, a 25 year fix. We got the ICANN, right? That's a fucking tap dance. Don't do that yet. What, what people are most likely going to comply with are people who are just straight to the point. Like, hey, let me help you save some time real quick. Come on. Get it? But they feel the momentum moving forward. This is how like, people on my team are killing it right now. Um, their tonality is just moving forward. It's not saying, okay, well, what are you looking for? And then kind of you know, back and forth. All right, should we go here? Uh, right? It's like no one, can, no one knows who's driving. And it's important to really spot that. But how you do it, again, is, is capturing the reasons why, their whole why. And so if I asked them and said, hey, um, do you have any other debt besides the mortgage? Of course, a lot of them are going to say that they got debt. If they say they don't got debt, then guess what? I've learned this information within 20 seconds of my call. So I can quickly gauge where this person is. He's probably got a good FICO. He's probably got good assets. So I'm going to change my conversation to be more about what's your plan with this home. Right? I'm not going to be like, hey, you know, how much in credit card debt do you have? But because the majority of the people that we talk to are those with credit card debt. These are the families who still have 3.25. Regardless of where they're at right now, they have a situation right now. Get it? And so if I found out through this person that um, you know, they got, let's say, $30,000 in credit card debt. Is that a fair amount to say? Pretty common? And then I'll ask them, I'll say, okay, cool, how much do you pay towards the credit card debt? just roughly, I don't need an exact, and I'm listening to their response. Because if, if they say like, I think we, or we, then I'm paying attention to who needs to be at the pitch table. Make sense? If they say uh, uh, maybe around 600, like they don't know, I know that somebody else needs to be at the pitch table. Because they're not tied to that number. Get it? I need the person who's tied to the number, who feels the pain from that number to be at the pitch table. It's very important. If you can do that moving forward, I guarantee you will increase your sales. It's just making sure that the person who is emotionally tied to the number is there at the pitch table when you pitch. But, um, and they'll also, or sometimes they'll say 355 bucks, like spot on, like ooh, this person knows their numbers. Get it? But regardless of what they say, I then back it up and say, is that the minimum or are you paying above and beyond? A lot of times they'll say, oh, we're just paying the minimum. Got it. But now I at least have some leverage. So if this person gave me kickback, then I'm going to you know, put that back in the air. 
and be like, hey, you know what? No, I understand that you don't have any time. I understand pricing is, is, is important to you. But here's what I did find, Jim, is that because of your inability to pay above the minimum towards your credit card debt, I can imagine that you don't have at least 12 months of living in your bank account. If this is something that you believe needs to be done, I think I can help you. Now they can't find, okay, well, well what do you got, right? This is how you bring them back, but you wouldn't know how to bring them back if your focus was on interest rate. Got it? Oh, you just need the interest rate. Well, what do you got right now? I got 3.25. What do you do? How do you come back to that? E. <laughs> e. <laughs> There's nothing that you could say to that. So why ask it? Get it? And how we ask it, we don't necessarily say, what's your rate? Well, how we ask it is, how can I help you? Right? Or what are you looking to do today? That's actually how we invite them to say, engage the rest of that conversation. And then finally getting shopped. The reason why I say we're a direct servicer to the source is because these people already, you know, depending on how they connected to us, they feel the need to shop. They feel the need to compare. A mortgage is a very, very, very important decision. Got it? This is the biggest debt that you have. And, but I need you to understand something also is that just like, you know, not everybody did invite themselves here, not everybody thinks of certain things the same way. So people will think of a mortgage in a completely different way than another person. Like for example, some person will look at a mortgage as the thing that they need to pay off as soon as possible, right? And this is typically from the prospect who says, oh, but I'm going back to a 30. Makes sense, then that will come up. And so now you kind of see his view on the mortgage. Okay, great, you're trying to pay it off. And, let's, and typically it's funny because the people who want to pay off the mortgage are the 630 FICO, $90,000 in credit card debt, two cents in the bank, but they're worried about going back to a 30, <laughs> right? Like, no, no, boo-boo. <laughs> You're looking at the wrong part of the process. Look, this is what you, you, know, you want to do. And, uh, and, and, but see, this is, this is true, and I believe the reason why you guys laughed is because we already went through that. And I want us to pay attention how we reacted when that happened. It wasn't a laugh. I guarantee you it was with frustration. And uh, another thing about my mentor, I'm just sharing all these fun facts about my mentor, is my mentor told me to have patience for the, uh, for the less knowing or for the, for the uninformed, yes. So have patience for the uninformed. In other words, have patience for people who don't understand what you understand. These people are not NMLS licensed, they haven't been in the game, right? They're actually spitting out what they don't understand and if we have the patience to make it easy for them to understand, we make it easy for them to say yes. Make sense? And that's one major thing is like we have to make, them, make it easier for them to say yes at the close. We have to make it easier for them to say yes to take the call, to take the pitch, to answer back. And that's why wordplay is different. Right, like we leave messages instead of saying, hey, this is Daniel, just checking back on the numbers that we ran together on Monday. You know, I just wanted to see if you and your wife thought about it. You know, I, I, th I see some major benefit. The market did change though. So before the market goes up, I wanna make sure that you guys have any questions if we wanna move forward. That's one message and that's a very common message. You probably hear it all the time. You're like, damn, you just, you just said my message. <laughs> it might be you, boo. And, uh, and so the, the real way to leave a message, you'd be like, Hey Daniel, oh, hey Jim, this is Daniel. You know what, I, uh, I found something. I reviewed your file with my manager. He pointed something out, I completely missed it. You know what, let's do this. Before I send it over to you, give me a call back. I wanna get your feedback. Now that's a fucking message. Get it? I've made it easier for them to call me back. And I've made it, I made it enticing, I've created curiosity. It's the same exact message. All I'm gonna do when he calls back and be like, yo, what did you find? Oh, this is what I found. It, you know, first off, let me ask you this. When we talked, when you talked to your wife about, or blah, 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 what was the major concern? Was it the fee or the rate? And then they're gonna be like, well, the rate. Okay, got it. Well, here's what he pointed out, is that you can get a lower rate. We might be able to get a, you know, a, a property inspection waiver, right? And we might be able to do this, but here's the thing is he wants a second look at your file, but he's gonna need these documents. Now you can gauge them, right? But at least you got them back. And that's the whole reason why we leave messages. The, the problem is those, we'll leave messages and the people that we do get back and we can't sell them, we go right into selling. And then they're triggered to remember like, oh, I told this fucker no. <laughs> I told him no already. 
Does that make sense? I, I promise you this is how they think because people are just busy so they're processing things different way. And, 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 and if we don't look at that then there's no actual set course. We're not paying attention and giving respect to KPIs. Because KPIs ultimately is the science of saying okay well if I, if I do this and this then I get this. That's ultimately what KPI is. If you improve on your credit pool then you'll obviously improve on your, on your, on your lock or your, or your credit pool to lock because it's just natural. Right? So if you, in other words, if you can only lock one of 10, well then go take 20 and you'll get two locks. Get it? If you want three locks, then that just means you need 30 uh, leads that day. It's all up to you. And so sometimes you look at them like, man, there's no way I can get 30 leads. Okay, cool. So then I got something for you. It's the information I'm sharing with you right here. You want to be efficient. You want to lock, let's say, five out of uh, 10 people that you talk to. The way you do it is you just understand how they think and how they process and how they communicate, right? And if you can understand how they communicate, if you understand like these little uh, quotes of like people don't know what they like, they like what they know, and you really understand like, well, what does that work? Then you're doing more than just learning a script, right? I can give you script, I can give you script for days. I can say, hey, say this, say that, or I can give you the wording and say this, say that, but it's not that. It's, it's the message, right? It's, it's just understanding that communication. So I think that will definitely help you. Does that make sense? Cool. So, um, all right, so the, we're gonna wrap up in just uh, a few minutes. And I had a few other things on here. So getting shops, selling rate and fees, uh, unable to secure commitment at pitch call. Did I cover that? Okay. You guys, um, okay. So, um, okay, you might be like, hey, D, what do you mean by un being able to unsecure or secure commitment? Is after you do your pitch, you're only going to get so many objections or reasons why they don't buy from you, right? And typically those reasons are, um, I need to talk to my wife about this. And again, just like KPI, like we could find the leak. Well, why am I running into that objection? Well, the leak happened when you decided to set the appointment with them only. Get it? That's where the leak is. So if you know that the leak is here, then just change up your wordplay and strategy. Instead of saying, all right, instead of you thinking, because when you're done pulling an application and you're about to work up the numbers, this is typically how it sounds. All right, it's going to take me about 30 minutes to put the information together. Can I give you a call back in an hour? That's how the second appointment is. That's a fucking pitch call. Bear with me. I'm working on the curse words. Um, it, it, it's your time to shine. This is your only chance to justify the full hour that you spent with this guy, the 30 minutes that you're going to price it up, 20 minutes you're going to scrub their credit. You did, you're doing all this and that's how you're opening your, your time to shine. So if we instead actually made the time, right? And this is why it's effective and say, hey, you know what? Let me, let me run a few things by my manager. When they hear that, they believe they're, they're getting kind of red carpet. Does that make sense? They're getting something that's not necessarily available. That's, what, that's how they perceive it. I want to run something by my manager just to make sure he approves me sending this to you. Regardless of what he says, I'll let you know. And then you make the appointment. You don't ask for the appointment. So it's a difference of saying, hey, I, I, I'll have everything priced up in 30 minutes. Um, can, I, can I call you back in an hour? We'll go through the options. Right? That's usually how it's set up. Instead say, hey, I, I should hear back from my manager about 3 o'clock and that 3 o'clock is set by me because I've already looked at their work. I've already looked at the, their time zone, the likelihood of them being out of work, right? And so I set up the appointment like this, like, hey, I should be able to, I should get, I should hear from my manager in about a couple hours. Are you still going to be at work at five? No, I'm actually leaving at about 5.30. Got it. Well, it, regardless of what he says, yes or no, I'm going to call to get your consent and then I'll loop in your wife on our call so she can give consent also and that way I can have it in your inbox before end of day today. Make sense? Now it's like, okay, cool, yeah, just give me a call at 5.30. Boom, they do not know it's a pitch. Get it? They have no idea that we're gonna go over options. All they believe is that they're gonna get a yes or no from my manager. And why that's effective is because when, they, when you call them and they believe they're in a pitch, they have this guard up. So they're not gonna, they're, they're kind of convincing themselves to not make a decision. Because the resources we have today, whether we're buying a computer whether we're buying a lawnmower or we're buying a mortgage, we have the option to shop. Very, very easy, right? 
but we have to change their perception to believe that if they shop, they're going to the same place. And this is why I say I'm a direct conduit to the source. So if they bring up in the pitch that, oh, I just want to see what they got, no worries. If you remember, Jim, I'm a direct servicer for the source. What I meant by that is I'm your direct plug to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or VA or FHA. Get it? So the only reason I'm able to even help you <laughs> Sweet. So basically what I did was um, the, only, the only way that I'm able to help you is because I don't have as much yellow tape, meaning I don't need your tax returns, right? Like, because people believe they need to pull in two years tax returns. Sometimes we forget that other lenders still call for tax returns. It is our relationship that allows us to get by with the PIW. It is our relationship that helps us get by with just, you know, a work verification, a VOE instead of tax returns. But, some, but, but we forget to sometimes, that's the, that's the actual tap dance. Right is making it easier for them. Don't talk about your cool name products. No one knows what I can. You can go away. <laughs> right? No one cares about that. All they care about is what's in it for me. And so if we can kind of re restructure the way that we look at things and kind of build up this hype, you're building up the, mis the mystery, less history. Right? And the history part is like if you're saying, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go and put together a 30-year fix, a 15-year fix, no cost, with cost. Lender credit, no appraisal, right? And then I'm gonna to put together, I can. All right, I'll call you in an hour, right? Then you're like, whoa, that's a lot. And all of it seems like options. So in other words, I know I'm gonna be sold in an hour. Hey babe, do you got a minute? <laughs> this one dude's gonna sell us. But, well, what do you think? But, oh man, just forget them. Let's go check with our bank. We sometimes forget how others will react. And if we pay attention to how they react to certain things, we can kind of puppeteer that and make it work for our favor, got it? Um, so securing commitment is, uh, is making sure that they're there, but if their objection is, um, you know, three more minutes and we're out, okay? I appreciate you guys' patience. So if, we, if, we, um, if they say, hey, I wanna uh, hear back from what this other lender has to say, or I'm checking with my bank, you, can, you, can always, you should always agree with them. First off, don't talk down to the mortgage, right? Oh, never mind Loan Depot, did you hear about them? Because sometimes we might think that, right? We might react that way. Um, actually, again, agree and say, good, you should. As a matter of fact, the reason why I can help you is because I'm a direct servicer for, that, for the same entities that they're taking you to. The only reason why we have a lot of, of clients in Orange County, and now I'm starting to name things to them, right? But more importantly, when it gets down to this part of the process of your pitch and they're showing you resistance, the most effective thing to do is look at what they do for work. You guys do that? Look at their job title. Um, you look at their, their credit balance to credit limit on their credit cards, and then you look at the comments from bureaus, right? So if I was getting resistance and they're like, hey, I just wanna go and check out what this is, blah, blah, blah has. I'd say, okay, great, you should. As a matter of fact, the only reason why I can help you is, is basically I'm a direct conduit to the source. So ultimately, if they take you to the same destination, it's basically the same thing. The only thing that I can do for you is help you avoid broker points, broker fees, there's no high retail markup. Make sense? Because again, from a call center, we don't have that high retail markup. We're not selling what Ola sells. Sometimes we forget that. But when we, when we remind them that we all basically go to the same source and agree with them, say, here's, I have an idea. Let me just make sure you even have a bridge across. Because at the end of the day, if you're just gathering information, you can't even get it. Why even gather the information? Make sense? And then be like, okay, yeah, it makes sense. Here's, a, here's, here's the good news is, again, because I'm a direct servicer, the process with me is super quick. It's only a few weeks versus a few months. A lot of times, I don't even need an appraisal, right? And the only way that we can actually start is if I verify that you're approved. How am I able to do this? Again, is because my relationship with the source. There's a lot of agents out there that are helpful, but then again, there's even more who will just give you information to pull your credit. So to avoid this, let me show you how it's done right. Make sense? Here, here I have an idea. If I ask my manager, because you know, the market is where it's at, if I ask him for a reservation, not a lock, right? Change your word from lock to reservation. You should never say lock. 
unless they've given you everything you need and you're just about to submit the loan file. That's the only time they should hear the word lock. Everything else is just a reservation or let's see. Just to confirm that there's a bridge across, let me make sure. Because this is the give take, give take, right? So if we give them a lock without taking the documents, what's their incentive to give us the documents? Right? They're already locked with us. They're cool. Right? They feel secure. This is what triggers their mind when they hear the word lock. Cool, so that, that will help. And um, that's pretty much it. I, I know it's been an hour, uh, and I meant to have some Q&A for you guys. Um, you know, for those of you guys who don't know me, I'm about as easy to approach as, as there is. So always feel free to come up to me, shoot me over a message, and be like, hey, man, what did you mean about this? And if I already got some content collected, I'll just forward you over the video, and you can watch it on your leisure or on your downtime.